Okay, so today is uh, this afternoon now we'll switch gears and we'll talk about we'll talk about uh, a different type of uh, genomic aberration that um, is, is, is actually at the very precise nucleotide level uh, and that is uh, somatic point mutations. And so here's just an example of, uh, a, 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 a mutation in a rare form of ovarian, of ovarian cancer where um, you have a, uh, a substitution here that is um, a, a C to G substitution uh, and that's, this is essentially the pathogenic uh, mutation in this particular <coughs> disease. Okay, so we'll talk about mutations like this. So You've probably seen this slide already in the context of this workshop. Um, it's a very um, well-known slide that's uh, uh, probably um, overused, uh, but, but it essentially illustrates the point that, um, that cancer uh, is derived from acquisition of mutations in normal cells. And so here's the fertilized egg, uh, the very first cell, um, and then uh, throughout the history of the cell, uh, there may be an accumulation of mutations in the genome, and that's just depicted by these little um, glyphs here inside the nucleus of the cell. And um, and at some point, at some point, um, there is an acquisition of a mutation that uh, uh, denoted by a star here that will change the phenotype of that cell, and and ultimately. Uh, it base endow the cell with a, a growth, growth and proliferative advantage that results in a clonal expansion. So, so that cell will then go on to expand and proliferate and replicate itself. Um, and, and this process actually continues. So once uh, growth and proliferation has uh, been acquired, uh, then DNA replication um, will happen more frequently and the likelihood of additional mutations being acquired will increase. And, and so uh, at some point, there's a, a, the rate at which mutations are accrued in a cell will expand, uh, and that can lead to uh, additional phenotypic changes, including, for example, um, acquisition of, of chemotherapeutic resistance and um, other phenotypes. Okay, so, in addition, so, so one could actually substitute these glyphs. This can be... Uh, a mutation, it could be a copy number change, it could be a rearrangement, um, and, and so uh, these are all uh, generalized in, in the sense that these are genomic aberrations derived from, from normal cells. So with respect to individual mutations, uh, this is just so we're all aligned here, this is a particular type of uh, variation that we're, we're interested in in this, in this section of the, the workshop. And this is, uh, for example, a single nucleotide change. Here's a G to T mutation. Um, this is actually a real mutation in a gene called P53 uh, in a breast cancer. And, um, and this one single nucleotide change um, is, uh, is likely the, the driver uh, event in this particular tumor. It causes a, a truncated protein and, and uh, will uh, result in P53 not being expressed in this particular tumor. Um, and so... So in addition to uh, the copy number changes I talked about in, uh, in the last lecture, uh, there are a number of point mutations existing in, uh, in oncogenes such as KRAS, BRAF, um, and kinase domain mutations in EGFR and KIT um, that are targetable. And, uh, and so uh, KRAS and BRAF testing are now um, pretty much routine in, in, in these types of diseases, so BRAF uh, a large percentage of melanomas are afflicted with um, a V600E mutation. Uh, it's the very same mutation in, in this um, uh, portion of melanomas that harbor it. And, um, and there's a targeted therapy against that particular mutation uh, that can inhibit uh, the, the, the oncoprotein that is uh, developed. And so, uh, and so knowing the presence of a mutational profile can be very beneficial in terms of selecting targeted therapy for patients uh, and also in just understanding the biological properties of disease and identifying new targets for, uh, for additional therapeutic strategies. Um, so actually, before I leave this topic, I mean, so what's, what's with the availability of, of sequencing technology the way it is right now, um, there are now uh, large um, efforts underway in, in 
across the world in many different academic and also commercial labs to develop um, targeted panels that can sequence for the presence of just these mutations. So for example, um, uh, in, in, it can be done very inexpensively and, and in a high throughput manner to, uh, to just profile a, a very small subset of the genome for which um, there are actionable mutations. And these are so mutations that an oncologist could actually potentially do something about and, and take a drug that's uh, FDA approved and used in other indications and, and administer that drug to a particular patient. And, and this is now being adopted uh, across um, a lot of genetics labs all over the world. And, and so, um, so as we learn more about the mutational landscapes of cancer and, and what mutations are, are potentially oncogenic and, and for which there are therapies against, this will only become uh, more and more in, uh, applicable to clinical, the course of clinical care. So, of course, the best way to, uh, to be able to identify mutations is through sequencing the genomes. And, uh, and really, so, so this uh, is a, a picture that probably should be familiar to most of you. It's from uh, the Hanahan and Weinberg um, uh, classic review paper on the hallmarks of cancer. And there's actually been an update that was the 10-year ten, anniversary to this. But, but the point is, is that um, all cancers harbor certain biological characteristics. And the question is, is what genetic abnormalities actually underpin these characteristics? And, um, and so what genes or pathways are disrupted due to these somatic genome aberrations? And again, these can be copy number changes, rearrangements, uh, point mutations. And, uh, and so, so there's been, um, as you, you've been exposed to by now, uh, incredible efforts uh, and, and levels of investment being put forward into sequencing and, uh, uh, the ca cancer genomes in a number of different contexts, from large population-based studies um, to, uh, to understanding uh, mechanisms of the, uh, chemotherapeutic resistance, and, uh, and huge efforts um, international on the international scope have, have been placed on really trying to understand these properties from the perspective of, of what mutations exist within uh, uh, different cancers. So before we dig into the actual analysis of, of data, I wanted to just take a step back for a minute and, and think about how is it that tumors come to be the way they are. So that um, graphic that I showed at the beginning from Mike Stratton's paper which shows a sort of linear trajectory, um, ignores uh, some fundamental properties of, uh, of, of how tumors uh, arise. And that's really about uh, the notion of, uh, of Darwinian evolution in the sense of um, considering the tumor cell or the clone, uh, the population of cells that, that share the same phenotype, um, as a unit of selection. Okay? And this was originally articulated uh, by Peter Knoll in, in, in Science in 1976. And um, he cast this problem in, into the uh, context of phylogenetic evolution. Okay? And so what, uh, and he proposed this clonal evolution theory of tumor cell populations. And what that theory uh, predicts is that, first of all, uh, tumors will change over time and through anatomic space. Um, and acquisition of mutations uh, will eventually lead to phenotypic changes that will confer sele selective advantages in clonal expansions. And what that means is if you uh, consider uh, this phylogenetic tree here, this encodes the structure by which cell populations in a tumor are related to each other through genetic abnormalities. And this has certain properties to it. And the first is that uh, Clones that are at the root of the tree will propagate their genetic abnormalities down to the, to the branches and the leaves of the tree. So these cells here will inherit the genetic abnormalities from, the, from this clone here. Okay? So we start from the normal. Uh, then we have some sort of genetic event that uh, transforms this normal cell into a malignant cell. So this cell harbors all the genetic variation that exists in this normal cell, but has acquired something new. And that will result in a clonal expansion. And, and then similarly, we can have this branching process that 
um, that will result in, in when we reconstruct the tumor uh, from its phylogenetic history, uh, something that looks like this. And that will result in also in clones that may acquire a, uh, an aberration that is not selected for. So it will be deleterious to that clone, and that clone will just basically die out and, uh, and won't expand. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, and so the end result of this is that tumors will be composed of, of clonal populations uh, with different underlying phenotypes, okay? And, and uh, so we shouldn't be under any illusions that tumors that we're sequencing or studying uh, are, are homogeneous entities. They're mixtures of cell populations. And that has um, it, it, lots of consequences for how we might interpret the data uh, going forward. So another way to look at this is that um, we might have a population of cells that, that looks something like this. So let's say we have this population, uh, this brown population here that is characterized by uh, mutations A, B, and C. And, and we call the uh, mutational profile of a clone its clonal genotype. Okay? So one of these cells may then acquire a mutation, uh, let's call it mutation D, and that will result in a clonal expansion. So we get this population of orange cells. And then uh, that one of these cells may acquire a, a mutation G that will result in a clonal expansion um, that results in the, in the green cells. And so this has uh, certain consequences when we look at um, the, what we call the mutational prevalence, or uh, muta here called mutation frequencies, in, in this population. And the idea here is that these mutations A, B, and C, they're the earliest events that create this, this tumor, uh, they will be present in all cells, okay, because again, it's the earliest mutations are propagated forward in the evolutionary history, and so that they, the, they will be present everywhere. So these will have mutation frequencies of near one, okay, so it, all cells har harbor mutations A, B, and C. Um, now, we know that D is acquired later, and so uh, in all but uh, a few cells, uh, you'll notice that here, 17 out of the 21 cells, so not the original cells here, uh, will harbor mutation D, uh, because if you trace this tree, then this is, this is pretty high up. But then some of, the, uh, some of the mutations, like G, for example, will have been acquired late and only be present in a subset of cells. Okay? So this is an important concept that we'll get to later on in the lecture, uh, in that the prevalence of mutations in the population gives you some indication of where in the evolutionary history uh, those mutations arose. And we can use that to try to reconstruct this mixture of, of cells. Um, of course, we don't know this mixture, and we, we want to try to infer something about this mixture from sequencing data, and I'll get to that uh, a little bit later on. So again, we have these uh, po different populations, and the, the key questions that we can ask of these populations is, do these clonal genotypes, for example, do they drive different phenotypic behavior? So how do these, how does the green cells versus the orange cells, for example, respond to a particular drug intervention? Um, are all the cells equally susceptible? Are some resistant and others not? Um, and will, will the orange cells, for example, expand uh, under the pressure of a, of a drug selection? Um, or even in different microenvironments, so in different parts of the anatomy or even in uh, uh, different micro parts of the anatomy. And so, uh, we, really, a fundamental question is how this phenomenon, which we know exists, um, how does it relate to treatment response, progression, and metastasis? Okay. So, have we visited the concept of driver versus passenger mutations? I talked a little bit about it in the previous lecture, but did we, have we? Okay. So this is a, um, a difficult uh, topic because there, there, there are lots of different views of what is a driver mutation and what's a passenger mutation. So uh, a driver mutation, so the, the analogy here is, of course, you know, you have, you have a bus and you have one person at the, the wheel who's driving the bus and that person is actually in charge. And, that, and, and so, so the direction of, that the bus goes depends on that person alone. And the passengers are, of course, just along for the ride. And, and they actually have no, no say in the matter. Um, so the way I look at this is that we think of a driver mutation 
as a mutation that alters the phenotype at the level of the cell, and that actually creates a, a selective advantage for that cell, such that when uh, Darwinian selection is operating, that cell can expand, um, and, and there'll be a clonal expansion as a result of this particular driver. So, so, the, so that's, that's one definition. The passengers are, uh, are more or less uh, stochastically induced, so there's some sort of random mutagenic process. And you may induce, for example, uh, the classic example of a passenger mutation is a, is a synonymous mutation. So mutation in a gene that doesn't alter the protein, and so there's no way for um, selection to actually operate on, on that because it doesn't change the, the underlying biochemistry. And, um, and so... So this would just be um, along for the ride, so to speak, okay? So those are the two sort of fundamental concepts, is that we have the driver mutations that really alter the phenotype and, and creates a selective advantage, and the passenger mutations that just accrue uh, as a result of either compromise, mismatch, repair, or just, they just are, are, um, uh, are left unchecked because they don't um, have a deleterious uh, nor a, an advantageous effect on the cell, okay? So driver mutations uh, can have uh, a number of different properties to them. They can be what we call gain of function, loss of function, or switch of function. And, uh, and then these, um, uh, we can think of driver mutations as being tumorigenic or initiating the neoplastic transformation. And, and examples of this are, for example, uh, loss of function mutations in P53 or uh, KRAS codon 12. Um, these are activating mutations that really change the function that are considered amongst the earliest events in, in, an, in a tumor's evolutionary history. Uh, we know that driver mutations can confer metastatic potential. So this has some sort of implication in that these mutations are, are, are really required to create the malignant phenotype to begin with. Okay? Um, uh, and so these are really important early on in the evolutionary history. These mutations here um, may have to do with um, potentially acquiring uh, contact uh, independence from, from your neighbors, for example. So cells that can, be, can, be, can actually exist without, uh, without being in a, in a tightly cohesive uh, matrix of cells. And, and so this might be something that uh, would not create a tumor, uh, but may be required for that tumor to spread. So there's a temporal aspect to this. And then finally, when there's intervention, uh, there may be a mutation that um, has nothing to do with uh, tumorigenic properties or metastatic potential, but uh, it does confer some sort of uh, resistance uh, to a drug. And may maybe there's a mutation that uh, um, activates a, a pump that allows um, uh, the cells to pump out a drug, and therefore those cells become uh, resistant to the drug and, and, and will therefore expand. And, and again, since these mutations are occurring late, they will have accrued uh, and, and carry forward all the mutations that have been accrued prior to that. And so, uh, so those will still have the malignant properties and, and, will, and that, that will allow for expansion. Um, so, so this is just a nice uh, review that, that talks about different mutations that are involved in these different processes. And um, so I encourage you to, to review that. Okay, so let's talk about um, these uh, oncogenic mutations or activating mut mutations. These are very much gain of function. And uh, so, so one classic example is the PI3 kinase uh, gene. There are two uh, hotspot kinase domain uh, mutations um, clustered around uh, 545, amino acid 545, and this one is 1047. And, uh, and so uh, many uh, tumors exhibit uh, mutations at these exact amino acids, um, but there are other mutations spread throughout the gene as well. Uh, but this is a, a, a really a nice canonical example of, uh, of an activating oncogenic mutation. Other examples are KRAS codon 12, which I've already mentioned, and the BRAF V600E in, in melanoma and also in, in colorectal cancers. So these particular mutations, uh, it's very much identical. It's the same amino acid, same substitution that happens in different individuals. So this is a, uh, uh, an example of what we call convergent evolution. So we know that these, that, that these individuals are not related by any other mechanism. And so, so these are mutations that um, uh, just happen independently of each other in different patients. But what gets selected for 
um, is the is these particular mutations because they drive a clonal expansion and uh, and create the malignant phenotype. Okay, so so these this pattern uh, here, the key thing is that these patterns will be localized in clusters uh, around the particular amino acid or the or the protein domain that's being affected. Okay, and 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 I'll show you the contrast of that. Melissa has a nice paper talking about this in uh, PPP2R1A mutations as well. Okay, so by contrast, we have uh, tumor suppressor loss of function pattern. And you can see here that uh, this is uh, a protein called ARID1A. And this is involved in chromatin remodeling. And uh, you can see here that there are mutations that are spread throughout the protein. And, and the characteristic of this is that most of these aberrations uh, will it either induce a premature stop codon, so they're nonsense mutations, uh, or they have they're frame shifting uh, insertions and deletions. So they, they disrupt the reading frame of the protein, so that has a similar effect to a nonsense mutation. Or uh, sometimes these, these proteins are affected by uh, deletions, such as homozygous deletions that I showed in the, in the previous module. Okay, so this is a classic profile of a tumor suppressor. P53 shows a profile like this, um, and, and other, other tumor suppressors such as P10, RB1 will show profiles like this, okay? Uh, so, uh, and also BRCA1 too. So that's a, a stark contrast to, uh, to the clustered mutations that we see in the oncoproteins such as BRAF and KRAS. Okay, so let's just talk about this concept of, um, of digital sequencing for a minute. So um, one of the properties of next generation sequencing, in addition to its um, cost effectiveness in the sense that we can cover the whole genome <coughs> in a relatively inexpensive and, and in both in time and money space is that uh, we get digital representation of the DNA mixture that we're sequencing. And so here's just schematically, um, we have some sort of soup of DNA that we've extracted from our population of cells. And some proportion of those cells will harbor a mutation. So here's this mutation G um, that may be represented at about 30% of the alleles, let's say. Okay. So, so then we can uh, create a library from this mixture of DNA, and then we can sequence it. And when we take those reads and we align them to the genome, uh, we can see that uh, there's a certain proportion of reads uh, that harbor that mutation. And, and this will be proportional to, uh, to what was present in the initial sample. And the advantage of the digital technology is that we can sequence very deeply in a targeted way and get very precise representation of the allelic abundance of a particular mutation. So even if it's occurring in less than 1% of cells, we can still resolve that because we have uh, what individual molecule sequencing essentially. Okay. So that's just a concept I want to carry forward uh, to the rest of the lecture. Okay. Any questions so far? It's the after lunch lecture, so <laughs> I see tired eyes, but I don't want to see any closed eyes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Asking questions is a good way to stay awake. Um, <laughs> okay. So let's talk about um, statistical considerations for modeling these allelic distributions. So I've already talked about this, but I, it's worth re-emphasizing. Okay. So, um, so we have again we have tumor normal admixture. Uh, in these samples, we talked about we've had intertumoral heterogeneity. We've, con we've talked about that. So, with respect to um, modeling specific alleles, the the copy number changes that you talk that we talked about in the last lab have some pretty important implications for when we measure the precise allelic abundance of particular mutations. These can also be in influenced by uh, by copy number changes, and so uh, we'll 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 talk about a fairly advanced topic later on that. Um, that uh, tries to ad uh, address this, this phenomenon when, when inferring uh, properties of mutations. And, and then the other really unique thing about, um, about the cancer space here is that um, 
the experimental design to capture mutations really requires uh, the simultaneous sequencing of a, of a match normal. And, and so that, um, that immediately changes the, uh, the analytical strategy uh, to look at these libraries. So uh, we know, as I said, we know that they're highly correlated, and so we should take advantage of that. All right. So what actually happens when we sequence a, a genome is that we might get uh, millions or billions of these read fragments. Um, these, are, these are sequence reads uh, that uh, come off the machine. And, and when, we, when we start this process, uh, and, and this, the data come off in, have you talked about FASTQ format? <coughs> yes? Okay, so no FASTQ. Okay, so pretend that each one of these is a FASTQ format. But we have no idea where these reads align to the genome. So the first step is, is basically taking a reference sequence and, and trying to uh, put these reads in some sort of semblance of order. And you can consider this as a, a giant jigsaw puzzle. And it sounds like you um, did some work with alignments yesterday. And the idea here is that once we do this alignment, there's numerous uh, approaches to this, is that the biological variation uh, starts to illuminate itself. And, um, and so we can look at each read, we can take uh, the concept of whether this particular nucleotide matches the reference at that particular position. And so we can see there are some examples here, like this one, this A here. This does not match the reference. This, the reference has a C. Um, but, but there's really only one read that has uh, a mismatch there. And so this might be due to a sequencing error. It might be due to a rare clone uh, that uh, uh, it harbors this particular, it might be a real mutation present in only a rare clone. Um, then we have these other lo uh, locations that uh, have uh, essentially reproducible uh, variation. So here we have three reads with a T uh, where the reference has an A. And so we might be quite confident that this, this particular location harbors a, a mutation. So we have three independent observations of that mutation uh, in the reads that we sequence. Okay. Uh, and then consequently, uh, this one here, uh, similarly, uh, this would be uh, uh, an example where we have six out of seven reads harbor a mutation. So, so what could be the interpretation, for example, of this column uh, versus this column? Why would only half the reads have a mutation here and, and almost all the reads have a mutation here? Possibly, yeah. So let's just project this onto um, onto uh, proportions. So here we have three out of six or fifty percent, and here we have six out of seven or almost a hundred percent. So. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. So, so you could have heterozygous mutation and homozygous mutation. Um, so this would be both both alleles are affected, or um, or you have biallelic inactivation or biallelic mutation, and here you have just a, a single heterozygous mutation. Could be just a snip. We'll get to the that later, but um, but let's say this is the tumor. Um, and then what about um, what about this one here? I don't know why the C is highlighted. It shouldn't be. Um, uh, but this one here, uh, this, this could be, as I said, due to a number of different factors. It could be a sequencing error. It could be a misaligned read. It could be a number of different things. Okay. Good. Can yes? Can we add gap in the sequence to make C inside? Align with the column, C? Here? Yeah, if we add gap before C, for now C is aligned with the full column. Is that plus one or that's not? Well, then it would um, push all, it would push the rest of it to be misaligned. I, th I think really this this C yeah, this is C. meant to be here. <laughs> this this should be this base that's highlighted, and not the C. Yeah, just a mistake. I've had this slide for five years, and this is the first time I've noticed this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's been a clonal expansion. 
Um, okay, so, so let's talk about uh, this experimental design of a tumor exome and, and a normal exome. Um, so this could be a genome or an exome, it doesn't matter. Uh, but we have representation of a tumor and the normal. And so we've, we've uh, developed a couple of strategies for this. And, and it, you know, at the risk of, of, of being a little bit um, narcissistic, I, I don't want to focus really too much on my own tools, but um, just to use those to illustrate the concepts that I think are important in, in an analysis of this data. And, um, and so, so I'll go through these two, two methods and, uh, and just to illustrate the concepts that are important. Well, naturally. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so let's um, let's talk about the, the data now from a tumor normal pair, and this comes from uh, Andy's paper at um, of an encourage I want to read. Uh, so, so here's an example of uh, just a, a small segment of the genome, uh, and and the normal data and the tumor data. So. So now here we expand this concept. Um, so let's say we just look at this column here. So this is very much like that other column that I showed where you have half the reads uh, in both the, the normal and the tumor that uh, harbor a particular variation. Okay? And so when we see the variation in both the normal and the tumor, uh, that's indication of a germline polymorphism. Okay? So that's shared uh, between all the cells. And, uh, and that's because uh, this is probably present in the, the very earliest uh, zygote that uh, is created. Uh, is it the very first cell, okay? Um, and then we have, uh, so this is a heterozygous shared mutation. And then here we have a mutation uh, or a variation that is um, homozygous in both the tumor and the normal. And so uh, this is just a case where the, both the maternal and paternal alleles um, are, are the same, and, and they both are different from the reference. Okay. Uh, and then we have this uh, red column here, and that's uh, a locus where the, the normal indicates no source of variation, and the tumor has half the reads that show a variation here. Okay. And, and so we can project all this down into uh, a very compact representation of the data. And so here we have all the, the nucleotide level uh, uh, and, and the actual bases here. But at its very essence, uh, essentially we, we can reduce this to a binary problem. Does the read match the reference uh, or not? And, and that's where this projection on to, into counts here. And so the A represents the, the number of reads that match the reference at each that at each position, and then D is the number of reads covering that position. And this will be variable across the genome, this, this depth here. And I don't know if you've talked about experimental designs and depth of coverage and things like, like that. Have you, yeah, you've gone over that, sort of. Okay, so, um, so depth of coverage here, I mean, this is obviously um, quite shallow. Uh, it, it, usually we try to achieve at least 30x coverage, but just for illustrative purposes um, here, it's, it's somewhere around six. Okay, and we can do this that for the normal, we can do that for the tumor, and so we get basically these four vectors that um, can produce the input data into our statistical model. And, and the concept here is that we try to take each one of these columns and assign it a particular, particular bi biologic class. And so here you have a germline heterozygous, and this sort of goes into the red here, so sorry if you can't read this. Germline heterozygous, germline uh, homozygous, and a somatic heterozygous here. Okay. So we try to take these, these count vectors and assign them into these biological classes. Sounds a bit familiar to the copy number idea, right? So we take some sort of signal and we try to assign some biology to it. So if we just focus on this red column here, uh, we can uh, we can encode this in a nice probabilistic model and, uh, and, and then the uh, we can look at the probability of each of these possible uh, nine combinations of, um, of, of normal tumor uh, joint distributions, okay? And so uh, the, there's a good indication from the signal here that this is, uh, has a high probability of being AAAB um, or a heterozygous somatic mutation. Okay. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. So if you to look at this uh, at this column here, 
then most of the probability mass should be on this BBBB. So, so if, you're, if we were to compute this matrix for this particular position, then, then this would probably be somewhere around close to 1.0 uh, for that particular part of the matrix. So, so the problem we try to solve here is that um, we know that the genotypes of the tumor and the normal are highly correlated. And as I said, the mutation rate for, uh, for cancers may, may be somewhere in the order of, uh, of 1 in 10,000 nucleotides, um, maybe less. And, uh, and, and so the polymorphisms tend to really dominate. Um, and so, so we need to be able to have a way to distinguish the germline events from the somatic events in a rigorous uh, statistical fashion. And so this model here called uh, joint SMV mix, which is developed by Andy, uh, it is a solution to this problem, and so here the input data is a is a normal uh, BAM file and a tumor BAM file, and uh, and without going into the details of this, uh, essentially this this model allows uh, the data to be considered simultaneously, and that allows for uh, uh, a borrowing of statistical strength across the samples, and that confers um, some measurable improvements in, in accuracy, and in particular, uh, the ability to, um, to isolate germline polymorphisms and distinguish them from somatic polymorphism or for somatic mutations. So I would encourage you to read that if that's uh, of interest to you. And I think that's the tool that Andy's going to um, uh, have you go through in the lab to really examine in a hands-on way what a, what a germline polymorphism looks like and, and, and its ability to distinguish that from a somatic mutation. So, so we might have some predictions. Um, and so, so, you know, I've gone through this process of um, raw data, aligned reads, predicting um, variants. Uh, and then we might want to have a, a, a protocol for validation. And so, um, so this is quite important because they're, they're still, um, despite dramatic improvements in prediction ability, uh, we want to be able to um, confidently say that when, when you're talking about biology uh, or making a claim about a particular mutation, first of all, you want to be able to demonstrate that it's real, and second of all, that it's somatic. And, um, and so there are still uh, uh, quite a few instances of, of false positives, um, and, then, and then sometimes what happens is that the, the sequencer may may not adequately sample the variation in the normal. And so there's an illusion of a somatic mutation, but then upon uh, confirmation uh, that that somatic mutation actually turns out to be a germline polymorphism. So, so this validation step is really a, a, a critical step still uh, on the path to actually to, uh, getting knowledge and clinical relevance. So let's just look at some um, focus on this false positive idea. So. So let's look at um, different artifacts that might induce false positives. So, so you should have um, be familiar with IGB by now. So you've, you've read in sequence data to IGB, so you know what this means. That's good. Um, and so, so what I'm showing here is an example where this is the normal on the bottom, and this is the tumor. And so if you're just to look at this particular position, you can see that the normal is relatively devoid of, of variation, and the tumor uh, looks like it has some, uh, some, some variants in here. Uh, and now this is a, a prediction that was made that, that did not confirm. And, uh, and the reason is because these reads are all misaligned. And so these reads can um, um, basically be aligned somewhere else almost with the, uh, with the identical um, score. And so, uh, so the alignment process can introduce um, artifacts into the problem. So you have reads that don't belong uh, where they're assigned, and that can create the illusion of, uh, of, a, of a mutation. Um, so insertions and deletions wreak havoc on this data. Uh, this is a real uh, serious problem that exists, and uh, and so especially with ion torrent data, I'm sure you've experienced that. Um, and uh, and so these are uh, essentially when you, you think about this problem, you've got 100 100 base pair reads at at the most really for a whole genome these days. Um, some of the, the targeted sequencing can, can get longer reads, and there are other platforms that can get longer reads. But um, for, for on a standard high seat 2500 run uh, of a genome, you get 100 base pair reads. And you have to align those 100 base pair reads to a 3 billion letter space. And so that's, 
that's quite a, a no, a, an enormous task, especially in a, in a concept where the genome um, is quite repetitive and uh, has, uh, uh, has lots of places where um, there might be ambiguous alignments. And then if you throw on top of it the fact that um, some of these reads will harbor uh, are sequencing across uh, micro insertions or deletions, uh, that makes the problem that much harder. And so uh, what tends to happen is that uh, you may get uh, the aligners, um, just to be tractable, have certain heuristics associated with them. So uh, these would be less than 20. Yeah. It's just arbitrary, but s small. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so beyond beyond 20, uh, it, it's basically no hope um, to 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 sequence a um, an, an insertion or deletion that's at say 50 nucleotides in a 100 base pair read and, and expect that read to align properly um, is probably um, the very difficult. With the mate pair. Mate pairs help. Yep. But, uh, but I think the field has kind of zeroed in on the, the 1 to 20 range and as something that may be tractable with, with 100 base pair reads. But, um, but I still think we have a massive false negative rate with respect to mi these micro insertions and deletions. But the reason I raise this here is that this, this creates um, the illusion that if we tend to look at these positions in isolation, and so, of course, we don't... We don't troll through the genome in IGV and see the, see the context. We run an algorithm that, that, that runs across the whole space of the genome and treats each uh, position independently of the next. And, but of course, there's some sort of context that's involved here. And so here is a, uh, a, a, a couple of reads that have this insertion deletion. Um, it's probably misaligned in the sense that the gap is not long enough. And, and what that creates is it, it, if the aligner has forced this read to be in this confirmation, that's induced this illusion of a, of a somatic change here uh, in the tumor. And, and that just, you know, by chance hasn't happened in the normal. And it could be because the insertion deletion is, uh, is potentially tumor specific. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe in this case there's actually evidence that it's there in the normal as well. It's just in the tumor uh, data, um, the aligner has, uh, has resulted in a different type of alignment that, that has created the, uh, the, this artifact here. So this doesn't exist in, in the biology, and it's, it's simply an artifact of the, uh, of the, of the insertion and deletion. Okay? So that's something to really watch out for. So another, uh, another thing that can yield false positives is low base quality. So, um, so actually... IGV will encode the strength of the color of the mismatch according to its, its the quality of the base call. So what happens on these sequencers is that um, uh, the, the data are actually not discrete. So it's not in your FASTQ file, uh, the, the last line of the FASTQ file encodes a quality metric that's associated with that particular nucleotide of interest. Okay, and so, um, and so the, the colors... Um, only produce the, um, the result for the, the base colors produce the result for the most likely base, uh, but that might have a very low probability. So there may be only, um, there may be quite a bit of uncertainty as to what that base actually is. And so when you visualize that, um, the, you can barely see it here, but these are very faint um, uh, representations of a mismatch here. And, uh, and so uh, if these might just be above the threshold that you would um, that you'd normally discount. So, so these would just be low quality bases um, that would give again the illusion of, of, a, of a mutation there that doesn't exist. One of the most common uh, causes of, uh, of artifact is that we see mutations sequenced all in the same direction. So, so these, these reads all have some direction that, directionality associated with them. And they represent um, the strandedness of, of, of how these were sequenced. And, uh, and so typically uh, if we see representation where all the variants are sequenced in the same direction and you don't get the sequencing of reads in the other direction, that's most likely due to uh, an artifact in the optical PCR process uh, of, of the sequencers. And so um, this is something that 
is a pervasive and uh, major confounding effect in, in mutation analysis. And so um, if all the reads are sequenced in one direction, then you should watch out for it. Presumably there's an example of this in the, in the lab. No. Okay. All right. Well, this is just c collectively known as strand bias. And most of the mutation callers um, uh, now will account for this, but um, that's only recent, really. Um, only in the last year have a, a number of mutation callers now emerged that actually account for this phenomenon. So, um, and so usually by inspection you can see this. Um, and, and so uh, I guarantee that uh, if you have encountered sequence data, um, you'll have looked at a mutation and thought, aha, I've got a mutation, and then you go look at it and it's, everything's in the same direction, and you say, no, I don't have a mutation. That's hopefully what you do. <laughs> Melissa's done that. <laughs> okay, and then I think we still have um, some unknown sources here. Uh, so I've, I've reversed the, the tumor normal for this one, unfortunately. But um, So this is an example where um, everything looks good. Uh, there's no strand bias. The base quality is good. The alignment scores are good. Uh, there's no presence of an indel. Uh, everything looks fantastic. Um, but this one doesn't verify. And so um, there's something else going on here that we don't know. Okay. So, so this is just a, a, a way to introduce you to the fact that um, it goes far beyond just modeling allele counts. And uh, one has to be very, very wary of numerous sources of artifacts that exist in the data and that could lead you astray when interpreting mutations. Okay, so let's not dwell on the negatives and now let's talk about the positives. So here's some true, true positive examples of what it should look like. So, so here's an example of a mutation that um, I think would be quite difficult to detect but it's a real mutation that we were able to verify. Um, and by the way, all these examples are chosen from real examples in, in work that I've done. Um, these aren't just made up examples, this is real, real, um, real examples. So here's an example of a mutation that we were able to call and, and it uh, validates, but it's only present in a small proportion of, uh, of reads here. Okay, so this would be a true example, but one that's quite challenging to call. Here's one that's even more difficult, so uh, so it's a G here, is the is the variation, and uh, this may be present in, I would say, less than five percent of reads, uh, but it's there, and it's real. So what could be what could lead to a signal like like this? Rare clone. Okay, right, exactly. So there might be just a few uh, cells in the population that actually harbor that mutation, and that will be represented because of the digital nature of this technology um, in, in, this, in this way. Okay. And, and you'll notice that there are no reads in the normal that have that particular variant. Yes? Um, so there'll, there will be some false negative rate. Uh, that's that's going to be without question, and at some point um, the the signal uh, the, the sensitivity of the algorithm uh, will will converge with the noise model in the in the system, and so the the signal will be indistinguishable from noise, and there is some there's some threshold there that that um, takes place, and, and ultimately a lot of the variant callers and and somatic mutation callers have some sort of confidence estimates associated with the call and, and then it's about your, as an experimentalist, what's your tolerance for false positives? So do you, is there's a cost model associated with that? Do you, is it really bad if you miss a subclonal mutation? In that case, your tolerance for false positives is gonna have to go up. Um, is it really bad if you are polluted with false positives and you really only want to look at the, the creme de la creme of the mutations that you think are present in all cells, for example, in which case you can ratchet up your, your, uh, your, your uh, thresholding so that um, your specificity is high. So, uh, so that's just a trade-off that you have to decide as an experimentalist. Yeah? Related to that, how do you typically verify how do you choose which to verify? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have a large number of them. Yeah. So, um, so I think you can do that tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. okay. So, so there's 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 interpretation layers that that mm -hmm. go on top. of This is really just about signal processing, trying to find mutations 
on a genomic coordinate level. But of course, we can assign those genomic coordinates to which mutations uh, lie in protein coding regions, which are uh, which induce a, a amino acid change, for example, and then you can look at the specific amino acid change and decide if that's uh, uh, quite a significant change uh, in terms of, of what that might do to the charge and polarity of that particular um, amino acid, all that stuff. Um, whether that induces some sort of drug um, molecular docking uh, confirmation change um, in, a, in a protein that we know is targetable by a drug, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so typically, um, when doing population level studies, you may want to find, you may want to look at uh, mutations that might occur in more than one sample. Um, so the recurrent in the same gene or at, at the same position. Um, and, and so, so to, to validate, there are a number of different um, procedures. So what WashU uh, typically does in, uh, this is Elaine Martis' group at the, 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 the Genome Institute, and I think, oh, has Obi arrived yet? Friday, okay. So, so you can ask Obi about this, but typically what they do is they'll sequence the whole genome, they'll predict their variants, and then do custom capture on the positions that um, are just, uh, are, are, are showing interesting um, variations. And, uh, and so they, they just, they've designed probes essentially that tile the whole genome and just sub-select a set of probes designed and then, then capture that material again, resequence it if it's there again, and it's considered validated. But you can do other, um, you know, much more targeted ways. You can just design primers around uh, a particular variant of interest, generate an amplicon, and 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 throw it on a on a MySeq, or you can just do Sanger validation, for example, um, uh, which is very inexpensive and high throughput, but but but, uh, uh, um, but is maybe not sensitive to mutations like this that are are are, are subclinical. So a lot of different strategies to validate. Yes. Um, do you include data on the reference genome for assembly purposes? Because it seems like you already compared it normal. Mm. Do you, why also compare the reference? Genome? Yeah. So so right. So so the normal though is not assembled. Is uh, so it's okay. it's also just sequenced in the same way, and so the way to get um, to to um, tractably look at uh, the comparison is to take the the normal reads, align them to the reference, take the tumor reads, align them to the reference, and then compare. Um, if the now another way to, to do that though is uh, is is to assemble both genomes, and then look at the differences in the assembled genomes. But I would say that's a much it's uh, it's still an expanding field, and and you know I don't think that we have um, super reliable ways of assembling whole genomes yet, um, especially human level genomes, bacterial genomes, and, and other smaller genomes. I think we can we can do. Uh, but when you get to the whole genome scale, it gets quite, quite challenging. Yes? So if you're doing a medium to large scale validation experiment, um, do you feel that sequencing technologies are maturing to the point where um, you don't really have to do orthogonal assays? So if you call your variants on yep. Lumina, right now you have to run everything on ion torrents to get rid of platform specific? Um, there will be platform specific biases. I think that's, um, that's inevitable. Uh, so, so we'll never eliminate those, but but I think we we have matured to a point where um, we can reliably tell um, true mutations from from false mutations, and 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 some of that work is just to, due to advances in the in the methodology for for calling mutations in the first place, and so so our latest validation experiments show um, uh, almost 99 percent validation rates of the mutations that we're calling. Whereas five years ago or three, you know, four years ago, that might have been around 30 percent. So, so we've learned from our experiences and, and can now uh, much more reliably detect mutations. Um, now, that probably induces some sort of false negative rate that's un, unquantified at this point. But, um, but at least for the mutations that we find, we can confirm almost all of them. There's very few that, that don't confirm above, you know, the hot, very high confidence ones are almost all real now. Okay, and so actually this is a nice picture that shows that. So, so here, um, this is uh, data from, um, uh, from a study that we did, and, and this is 3,000 mutations taken from a spectrum of uh, triple negative breast cancers. And, uh, and what we did is we, um, we initially called these mutations just using the allele data. 
And what we found is that um, that doesn't, of course, doesn't account for all those artifacts that I that I just showed you. And uh, and so when, when, but when we start to account for those artifacts, and we can um, look at uh, different features of the data. And what, when I say features, I mean things like um, uh, strand bias, presence of an indel, um, uh, base quality, the mapping quality. Um, I think it, at least some of those things will be covering in the lab. When we, when we account for those, uh, we can start to very nicely separate the true somatic mutations from the false positive and also germline uh, variations here. And that's just shown um, uh, where we've taken um, each of the of 3,000 mutations and calculated uh, 100 different features um, on each one of these mutations and then projected these uh, using the principal components analysis. And you can see that the, the somatic mutations in this 3D space um, separate quite nicely away from the wild type. Um, these are false positives and, and germline, which are shown in red. And, and so now we, we, we can actually, this gave us some um, indication that we could probably train a classifier using machine learning techniques to distinguish these black dots from, from the others. And so, so we went ahead and did that and, um, and, and showed really good uh, performance in terms of, of accuracy. So this is just an ROC curve um, showing the performance in a cross-validation scheme uh, when we train this cl multi-feature classifier called mutation C. And we're able to outperform uh, standard methods uh, quite considerably. And so, um, and the other thing to note here is that um, all these different curves represent different um, classification schemes. Uh, but the point being is that the classification schemes performed equally well. The most important thing was that we considered all these features. And so, um, and so the, it's the addition, in addition to alleles, we need to consider uh, things like strand bias, uh, presence of an indel, et cetera, et cetera. And that uh, dramatically improves performance. So, um, and this is just some standard uh, tools uh, like JTK and, and SAM tools that, uh, that we compared. And then uh, zooming in on the elbow of the curve here, um, quite gratifyingly, uh, we were able to take uh, the training, the trained model from one platform, uh, Illumina, and apply it to solid, and actually performed remarkably well. So, so the, the initial training data was on exome Illumina data, and then we projected this onto solid whole genome data, and uh, and actually got reasonable performance here. So, um, so, so really, I mean, accounting for these features um, is quite important, and does translate across platforms. It's not perfect. It's, you'll notice that the, the curve isn't over here like it was before, but it's it's actually much better than um, than than the other tools. Uh, okay, so I think I'll just. Um, so what's the time? Three. Three. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. Okay. So then, then what we did is we took um, we took all these uh, mutations that were classed as uh, as false positives, and, and we took these features to see if we could actually group them by different classes, and and they fell out quite nicely into um, it into distinct groups that could explain the reason for the false positive predictions in the first place. And so we, have, we had misalignments due to repetitive sequence, we had strand bias, and a very specific uh, GGT to GGG sequencing error. So, so this is the, where the sequencing context is quite important. And this has been reported uh, several times now where, um, uh, where the sequencer reads these nucleotides as GGT I'm um, sorry, as, as GGG, when they really should be GGT. And so you might see, uh, for example, T to G substitutions um, that are quite re nicely represented in the data, um, but it turns out this is just uh, an actual uh, sequencing error. And, um, and this is part of why that is. Um, there's something in the chemistry that, um, that has a bias towards this. I'm, I'm not, yeah, yeah. The, it, well, it's actually, it, it's, it's ubiquitous. It's, it, multiple different platforms have shown this particular error as well. So, so it's just something to, to watch out for. So if you have a, a huge enrichment for T to G substitutions in your, uh, in your cancer genome, um, uh, you may want to um, think about looking into that. Uh, it's quite important. So this this was this was just a pattern that we were able to pull out. I think there are other trinucleotide combinations that um, have this problem, but the, the majority that's been I've seen reported is this one. 
Here's a group with low base quality uh, and also the, uh, the error and also strand bias. Uh, and so, so basically we're able to, um, to categorize uh, sets of variants as, as um, we could explain the error according to these different properties of the data. And that's really the point um, I, I want to try to make here. Yes? Nope. Technical artifacts. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about how um, we talked about copy number changes and we've talked about mutations and I want to explain how the two uh, actually intersect and, and show how copy number changes actually affect the allelic distributions of mutations. So so here what I'm showing is um, uh, a similar plot to what I, sh what I showed before. Um, this is a, uh, a, a tumor genome that we've studied quite well. Um, it was originally published in 2009. Um, and, and so this, this tumor harbors a, a high-level amplification of this arm of chromosome 19. And, um, and you can see that that results in uh, an allelic split of the, uh, the heterozygous polymorphisms here. And what's interesting is that this region harbors uh, a, a large number of, of mutations, okay? And this speaks to uh, uh, the sensitivity of, of methods. And I just want to illustrate this in a, in a sense. So, so I showed you a, um, a model before that uh, assumes essentially three different genotypes for a tumor. So we have AA, AB, and BB. But in a similar way to, uh, to what I showed for the copy number, allele-specific copy number changes, we can have mutational genotype that's affected. So you can imagine that if you have four copies, um, you could have any combination of this particular <coughs> mutational genotype. And when we account for that uh, and adjust the, the distributions, um, then, then we can really increase the sensitivity of the model. So uh, let me just show you that here. So, so what we found is that we, we employed this um, uh, extension of the genotype state space, and, um, and we looked at a uh, comparison to just a standard approach. And we found that um, in this genome, we found 200 non-synonymous protein coding changes that were unique to this method that allows for the genotype to expand according to the copy number. And, uh, and so we were able to confirm out of this um, that there were 24 somatic mutations in this genome um, that were undetectable by standard methods um, that now appeared in this, uh, in this new model. And a point, uh, important point here is that um, the original analysis of this tumor, uh, which was published in uh, Nature in 2009, uh, yielded about uh, 30 mutations. And so with this reanalysis, we actually almost doubled the number of, uh, of non-synonymous mutations in the genome. And, uh, and so um, I'll just skip over this. You don't need to know that. I've, st I've said the main points. Um, and and so, so the point is, is that um, the copy number will... Uh, the copy number architecture of the genome will distort the ability to find mutations in those regions. And, and it's important to, to just consider that and bear that, bear that in mind. And so we talk about false negative rates. Um, the false negative rates are, are due to um, all kinds of reasons, some of which are subclonal mutations. Others are actually copy number changes that might, uh, that might um, bury the signal that's, that's present in the data. Okay, so... Summary so far. So we've talked about um, these binomial mixture models, the, G the, the joint S and B mix, um, uh, a robust pro probabilistic framework for modeling allele counts, um, and uh, we've talked about joint inference of tumor and normal pairs, and we've talked about artifacts in the data, and we've talked about how copy number changes influence the allelic distributions. Um, any questions so far? That's a good question. Um, so, so really, this that model that I showed you really requires a priori knowledge of what the the landscape looks like. So, so for targeted sequencing, um, it, it, you know, the best way is to do an array uh, at the same on the same sample. So you have some notion of what the copy number architecture actually looks like. 
and then you can apply that in the context of targeted sequencing. You can't do it by counts. Um, it's difficult because the targeted sequencing, um, especially if you're just um, looking at parts of a gene or just even a gene in isolation, um, it's difficult to know. The copy number alteration will typically span a larger region than that. So you, so, so you just don't know from individual mutations of whether it's in a copy number change or not. You really need a global picture of what the chromosome architecture looks like. Yeah, and then yeah. to normal, doesn't help with that? Um, you that's, you know, the Yeah, so you can't like. distinguish between a subclonal mutation and a mutation that's, that, that has its allele, allele skewed by copy number. So, so it could be it could be subclonal, yeah, and, and have a, a properties, or it could be um, just uh, a, 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 a B type of gene, mutation of genes. Mm -hmm. We can't distinguish that. But for targeted sequencing, the sensitivity issue, which you want to address, is especially I mean, less of an issue because you have higher depth. Right. Sure. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, available tools. Um, SAM tools is quite an important suite of tools to get familiar with. Um, there's GATK, uh, which is, I think, also you probably have uh, already touched already. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, VCF format. Have you gone over the formats at all? No. Not VCF. Okay, but you're going to cover VCF a little bit? Okay, so we'll touch it on it in the lab. Essentially, VCF has become, uh, um, for better or worse, uh, the uh, standard um, representation of variants in the field, and um, and and I think VCF stands for Variant Calling Format, um, I think, and uh, and so there's a specification here uh, that I've listed in this URL, and essentially what it does is it has. Um, it has a chromosome, a position, uh, an ID for that, it has uh, the reference base, the alternate base, and then some information about, about the, the particular um, call of interest. Um, and so, and these last few, few fields are generally freeform. And so it's a format, but it's not really a format. So, uh, so that's why it's kind of, um, uh, you know, a little bit dubious. Um, somebody's nodding your head at the back there. You've got experience with this. So, uh, but but this is really the I you know it is the st the community standard um, accepted way of representing uh, uh, variants and um, and a lot of tools assume that uh, and especially the annotation tools that you might visit uh, in later days in the in in the lectures and uh, in, in the labs um, will assume that that there's some VCF format for variants. And so it's important to get to know this. I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, but, um, uh, uh, so, but, but what you can do is, is, is encode a fair amount of information in, in the VCF format. So uh, I've also just listed here a number of tools that have uh, been developed uh, specifically for the somatic mutation context. And, and I have to say this, this Literature has grown uh, considerably in the last, I would say, two years. Uh, I think, what, when did we publish our paper? End of 2011, early 2012. Um, so, so just over a year ago. And, and now there are probably six or seven um, reasonably good somatic mutation callers. But previous to 18 months ago, uh, there were zero. So, so the field has matured quite a bit, and um, I think Andy's was the first on the scene. So, yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Just around the same time. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, visualization tools. Um, you'll talk. You'll you'll go through IGV in the lab. Okay. And so, so then, what do we do with mutations once we have them, and I'm not going to spend much time on this except to just list these tools here. Um, there's a nice tool called Mutation Assessor that comes out of Chris Sanders' lab at Sloan Kettering, and um, and essentially what uh, this allows one to profile are the protein coding mutations, and um, it allows one to assess the impact of a amino acid substitution in, in many different contexts. 
So the way this works is that um, what this group did is they took all the pathogenic variants known to be disease causing uh, in, in the literature. So they went through OMIM and they classified um, pathogenic mutations uh, the known to exist in, 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 in both cancer and germline setting. And they looked at the properties of those uh, particular mutations in the context of their amino acid substitutions, uh, the protein structures, and, um, and their evolutionary conservation across species. And, um, and then developed a classifier that could score uh, a particular, a, a, an arbitrary amino acid substitution in the context of what we already knew. And, um, and so, uh, so, that, so this is what this tool does, is it takes a <clears throat> particular variant and, and will give it a score as to what its potential impact is. And also, uh, there's a nice web interface. If you go, you'll find it at this um, particular URL. And, you, and it allows you to visualize the mutation in the context of protein structure. So you can see where on the structure, 3D structure of, of the protein the mutation occurs. So if it's in a binding domain, uh, if it's in a, 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 or if it's in some sort of pocket, uh, you can see that. And, and then you can compare different mutations that you might see um, across uh, the, the protein sequence and see if they, those cluster together, for example, in, in, a, in, a, in a nice uh, three, in a three-dimensional space. And so this is a, quite a valuable tool that, um, that I quite like, although, um, you know, it's not perfect. And, um, for example, the PI3 kinase hotspot mutations um, are classed as you know, low functional impact. So um, it's not perfect, so, but, it's, but it's pretty good. Um, this is another tool that I just put up here because I think this is the tool that's going to be used in the, in the next section. It's called Anovar. I've not, I don't have direct experience with this one. Okay, so how else can we interpret mutations? So, um, so a lot of people uh, are talking about TCGA data. Um, this is data from the endometrial uh, paper. Uh, that was um, uh, published just, uh, when was it, last month? Very recent, yeah, so this is, I've updated my slides. Um, and, uh, and so what this shows is, um, is this is a, 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 a cancer, um, it's essentially uterine cancer, with a, with a really rich mutational landscape. Um, so uh, this is in contrast to, for example, the neuroblastomas that I was talking about earlier, where the, the mutational landscape is essentially barren. Um, there are almost no mutations to, to, to even discuss in those, those studies. This one, on the other hand, is, uh, is rich with mutations. And, and so what's shown here is uh, uh, mutations that were basically highly recurrent in the population. So many different um, uh, cases had had a mutation, and that's what's just shown on the y-axis here. And so you see a lot of the familiar players that I've already talked about, um, P10, P53, PI3 kinase, um, ARID1A I mentioned, uh, KRAS is there, um, PPP2R1A is there, um, and uh, I keep calling this the Melissa gene, but, um, uh, but it's not really Melissa's gene. Um, it's everyone's gene, but Melissa knows a lot about it. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so these are, um, these are just genes that are uh, highly recurrently mutated in the population. Now this is an example, again, of if we think about put our evolutionary hats on again, this is convergent evolution happening. So this is, again, all these, patients, these people are unrelated, but they have um, they've all developed uh, uterine cancers, and, and a large number of them have mutations in the same genes. And so there's some sort of phenotype that gets selected for when uh, these mutations are, have accrued. Okay, and then these stars here uh, represent something important. So uh, what we can do in population studies is we can ask the question, is my gene of interest uh, mutated more frequently than I would expect by chance? Um, and, and what by chance means is we can take into account the background mutation rate. So we just look at how many mutations does this tumor have? Does it have a lot of mutations? Um, we can look at the, the length of the gene and say, okay, how many mutations, given my background mutation rate, how many mutations would I expect in my gene of interest? And, and then we can ask, uh, given that background distribution in that gene, uh, is the foreground, which is what I observe, uh, higher than what I've expected by chance? And that's essentially what this tool here, this music tool, um, uh, mutational significance in cancer, uh, that's essentially what that tool calculates. And so the, 
the mutations with stars here represent mutations that are significantly mutated in the population according to those calculations. And, and this is just something you'll see over and over and over again in the TCGA papers. They love this. Um, and uh, uh, for better or for worse, again. And, um, and, and every single TCGA paper will have uh, a figure that has these, these significant mutations. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay, so that's one way of interpreting. So that helps when you have a rich mutational landscape and you have 500 tumors that you sequenced. Okay? Uh, we may not have that situation. Um, this is the other extreme now. So I'm going to talk about n equals 1 experiment, uh, where uh, this group um, sequenced uh, different metastases, metastases from the same individual patient. Okay? So this is taking samples from, uh, from distant metastases where the original primary was a renal cancer, uh, and then there are uh, a number of other metastases that were sequenced. And so basically, uh, uh, during surgery, uh, maybe during pri primary surgical staging, um, these different biopsies were uh, acquired and harvested, and then, um, and then each one of them was sequenced. And so what's shown here is each one of these rows represents one of these regions that was sequenced, and, uh, and then the column represents the specific mutation that was found. And so what I've shown here is um, the, the gray boxes represent... Um, where there's a mutation in that region, so a mutation in, the, in that particular sample, and the, the blue boxes represent an absence of mutation in that particular sample. And you can see that the profiles are quite different, and uh, thank you very much. I've been speaking too much. You guys got to ask more questions. <laughs> um, okay, so, so here what we have is the ancestral clone. And, and these are mutations that are essentially shared everywhere. That's why I call it the ancestral clone. Okay, so, so this would be a representation of uh, the mutational profile of the clone that underwent the initial expansion. All right? And then what we have is we, have, uh, we start to get um, quite significant deviation from this mutational profile. And so to the point where we have um, these mutations are, ex are, are specific to certain regions. Okay, so this region has only these mutations, and and so there's a, a what we call a descending clone that obviously shares uh, the mutations from the ancestral clone, but then has acquired its own uh, set of mutations that's distinct from the other regions. So this is a very very detailed look at one tumor, okay, and and what we can see is that there's dramatic uh, divergence in the mutational profiles uh, at different regions in the tumor. So this is really a landmark paper um, that uh, I think is quite important and significant. And um, the point being is that uh, in this paper, they describe mutations that are uh, regionally isolated that will uh, have uh, impact on therapeutic response. Okay, and so that explains why you might have a partial response in, in, in the tumor or, um, or a, 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 an intrinsic resistance uh, to therapy right off the bat. Okay, so this is kind of like a mid-level um, resolution between the single cell data that I showed um, in the previous lecture uh, and, and, and a sort of a one sample uh, examination um, that, uh, that, that is typically associated with, um, with this type of analysis. So this gives you a little bit of a, a better resolution on what the entire mutational landscape looks like in a tumor. What are those purple bars? Like, uh, purple bars are like... Uh, I have to direct you to the paper. I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's now talk about uh, a different concept. And so, um, one of the so we talk, we talk a lot about genes. We talk a lot about mutations projected onto genes, and we look at the coding regions, and we say, "Aha, we have non-synonymous mutations." And uh, and so I'm going to focus on that one percent of the genome that exists. But of course, um, in whole genome sequencing experiments, um, we have. Uh, a rich uh, set of mutations, often in the tens of thousands of mutations that we can predict. And, and we can leverage that data to learn something about the biology of the tumor. 
And so what this paper describes is um, a set of uh, what we call mutational processes um, in, in 21 breast cancers. And what they were able to do is, um, by sequencing the whole genomes of these 21 cancers, they noticed that um, there were specific um, substitution patterns that, would, that can fall out. And so um, there's generally an enrichment in C to T mutations, and then looking at the trinucleotide context of what base comes before the C and what base comes after the C, um, they were able to subclassify these tumors into, uh, into these different groupings. And so, uh, so they found these five different signatures, and what's really quite um, striking is that uh, when, they were, when they calculated the signatures for each one of these um, patients, uh, they found that uh, they cluster into uh, BRCA1 and 2 wild type breast cancers. So these are patients that don't have uh, either somatic or germline BRCA1. And a different class of uh, tumors that have, um, uh, that are, have BRCA1 and 2 uh, germline. And, this, and, and, and to be fair, this was a, uh, uh, a supervised analysis where the study design was to really try to understand the mutational mechanisms behind BRCA1 germline patients, so the Angelina Jolies of the world, um, who didn't have cancer yet, but, um, uh, but her mother and her aunt did. So, um, so, the, uh, so these are BRCA1-2 carriers, and they have a significantly uh, different mutational signature um, in terms of the actually nucleotides that, they're, um, that are uh, substituted. So that suggests a mutational mechanism that's associated with the BRCA abnormality. And, uh, and there's speculation in the paper that these are due to um, uh, cytosine de deamination enzymes called the APOBEC proteins, uh, and that presents, that presents potential therapeutic vulnerability to these, um, to these uh, particular cancers. So if you, you drive APOBEC in those particular tumors, then, um, then maybe you can, they, those cancers will mutate themselves to death, and, uh, and those cells will die. Okay, so, so this is uh, really quite nice, and this is, this is really gaining some prominence in the field as, as we gain more and more whole genomes. Uh, we're gaining uh, better insight into uh, in the type of mutational mechanisms that exist in these cancers. And there's going to be a paper emerging pretty soon from the Broad that shows this across a spectrum of, of 300 different um, cancers and shows that um, they can really be classed into different um, tumor types according to their, their mutational spectra. And so, for example, melanomas that are, in, that are induced through uh, environmental uh, insult due to UV exposure uh, have a particular mutational signature. Lung cancers that are associated with um, nicotine and, and tobacco smoke have a particular mutational signature, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and so there's some uh, really nice biology that can be extracted from just looking at the mutational signatures, and, and, and uh, this is independent of the gene content, um, and, so to speak, okay? All right, so I'm getting close to the end here. Any questions on this? This is a relatively new development that um, in the field in the last year or so that's gained some prominence. Okay, so, so let's talk about a little bit about clonal evolution again, and we can just wrap up with, um, with this, this concept. And, um, and so what, what this here shows is that uh, we can uh, look at the uh, uh, cellular prevalence of mutations, and, uh, and we can do this in, in, in a temporal axis. So, so what this represents is a follicular lymphoma that's been sequenced, and we have a number of mutations, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and then it's uh, a secondary biopsy from the same patient um, after relapse. Of, um, so, so this patient has been treated, and they have an initial response, and they come back uh, sometime later with a relapse. And so we've done some work on sequencing the genomes of, uh, of these pairs, and, and then we can compare their mutational profiles, and we can um, compare, using deep sequencing technology, um, the abundance of clones in the different biopsies. And so, so here's a clone, for example, that... Uh, has a, a centered around a cellular prevalence of about 60% um, of cells harbor this particular mutation in the primary or in the first biopsy. In the second biopsy, that's completely absent. 
Okay. So that the inference there is that that's a clone that's probably extinguished by therapy. Okay. So it doesn't exist anymore. But then what we see is we see on the other axis, we see a set of mutations that is completely absent in the primary biopsy, uh, but it seems to have expanded um, or has grown up in the, in, the, in the relapse biopsy. And we know we're sequencing the same tumor um, because a large number of mutations are actually shared between the primary and the, and the relapse. Okay. But it's these guys here that may indicate something about uh, resistance. And so, so there's a temporal, this really illustrates quite nicely the temporal element to how clones shift over time and that um, we are sequencing mixtures of cells and depending on the context of selection pressure um, that will, the, there's a dynamic nature to the composition of those cells over time. So I think what I'll do is um, I was going to illustrate this um, breast cancer um, uh, study, but I think I'm out of time here. And um, I'll just wrap up for this section. But you can look through the slides and you can read the paper that I've um, outlined here. And, and I just want to end with a, with a couple of um, well, a couple of thoughts. So, so there, are, I hope what I've convinced you today is that there really uh, uh, are enormous statistical challenges uh, for the future going forward. And, 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 and as new technologies emerge, uh, uh, again, new, uh, new challenges uh, follow that. And so uh, for mutation calling, uh, we still are trying to understand the sources of artifacts. We're getting much better at this. But there are all kinds of, um, uh, of concepts like base calling alignment and positional error rates that can affect. Um, we know that the biology of complex uh, biology of cancer is exceedingly complex, and um, you know I was complaining earlier about that few tools exist specifically for cancer data. Now that that is improving, and um, and most of the tools that are emerging now um, have uh, considered, for example, uh, copy number changes, tumor normal admixture, um, and and uh, tools specifically to assess mutational heterogeneity um, are, are coming online, and a Andy and I have worked on a on a on a problem um, to really try to quantify the degree of, of clonal diversity in a, in a tumor sample, um, and, uh, and we're, we're working on getting that work published. Um, I think what will emerge in the next little while are uh, single cell genomics. Um, it's going to become quite an important uh, field to really understand the clonal diversity that exists in, in tumors and specifically to understand what clonal genotypes are, um, are confer resistance to drugs and, and what gets selected for or extinguished um, in the presence of a drug. Um, sequencing cell-free circulating tumor DNA. Um, this is actually quite an exciting uh, field that I think um, is going to actually um, uh, emerge as uh, probably one of the more exciting developments in tumor monitoring uh, in the last probably couple of decades. And what this, what this is is that, again, leveraging the deep digital technology um, of, of these next generation devices, uh, one can isolate uh, uh, cell-free DNA that's been um, shed from tumors uh, in the circulation and, um, and through uh, experimental protocols isolate that DNA and sequence specific mutation. And the allelic prevalence of those mutations can be an indicator of tumor burden. And so you can take uh, through a non-invasive uh, uh, methods, one can follow a patient throughout their chemotherapy cycle and, and follow them afterwards. And by measuring the allelic abundance of these mutations, um, get some indication of whether there's a response or uh, whether there's um, potentially a relapse um, coming. And so uh, a few of the early papers have demonstrated quite convincingly that it's better than circulating tumor cells. Uh, and it's far better than imaging, for example, to predict uh, relapse. And, um, and can predict a relapse uh, up to 11 months in advance of imaging techniques, which is currently the state of the art. So you can imagine that you know, it's all about capturing these things early. And, uh, and so uh, this is a really promising technology um, that involves sequencing and, uh, and interpretation of alleles. Um, and, and then again, uh, the last example I showed where it revolves around evolutionary dynamics understanding how clonal selection is operating in different, in different contexts. So I would say that all these problems really represent uh, new statistical challenges that will need to be addressed. 
uh, and, and we really want to, uh, to, to make advances in that area and use appropriate uh, statistical techniques in order to maximize the biology. And so I just want to finish then with, uh, with a quote from Peter Knoll's paper. And uh, just permit me to read this here. So he says, the acquired genetic instability and associated selection process most readily recognized cytogenetically uh, results in advanced human malignancies uh, being highly individual, karyotypically, and biologically. Hence, each patient's cancer may require individual specific therapy. And even this may be thwarted by emergence of genetically variant sublines resistant to the treatment. And more research should be directed towards understanding and controlling evolutionary process in tumors before it reaches the late stage usually seen in clinical cancer. Um, so, so I think this is really uh, a, an amazing um, prescient paragraph in 1976. Um, and, uh, and, and the thing is, is that he, of course, didn't have access to these incredible devices that we have access to now. And, and I think there's actually really great hope that um, through example, through, through tum tumor um, monitoring, through ctDNA um, and other mutational profiling techniques, that we can actually get a handle on this. And I think that the road to personalized therapy, of course, would be paved with mutations. And, and so knowing the mutational content of a particular tumor uh, can really help in the therapeutic process. And, uh, and so uh, there's, there's a lot of work that's left to be done in terms of identifying uh, targetable and actionable mutations um, and, and really understand how drug, uh, drugs drive selection and, and resistance in different microenvironments in the tissue. Uh, and so um, I'd like to uh, conclude there and just thank you for your attention for the day and the couple of lectures and um, happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. Just like having more of your opinion, but like, you know, this single cell genomics and IT and all that, like, if you go crazy yep. sequencing absolutely everything, like, where do you think the stopping point is? So, like, how many cells would you actually have? Right, right. So, so I think what we're in a phase right now of, of exploration and discovery. And, um, and so we don't yet know, for example, um, we're only learning about single mutations as being potentially resistant. Right? But we have no idea about mutations co-occurring in the same cells uh, and how that actually has uh, some, some impact on, on drug resistance or drug selection. And so just knowing combinations of mutations uh, that, that might have um, some sort of selective advantage would be, I think, quite advantageous. And, and that we're just in early days there. So there'll be some, I think, quite a bit of explore, exploratory work. But eventually, you know, there'll be some knowledge that's gained from that. And, and, and that exploratory work at that level will probably stop. And it can be applied um, in the context of, hopefully, a, a, in terms of these, um, these sort of um, diagnostic tests in, in patients. And, uh, and so I think for the foreseeable future, uh, the next decade at least, we're still in this exploratory phase where um, we, we can um, drill down at finer and finer levels of detail to really understand the properties, the biological properties of, of what mutations are, are conferring. And, um, and ultimately, as you know, I mean, the, the, the acid test for this is in functional models and, and, and really trying to take these mutations that we discover and induce them in, in, into animal models and, and test, um, test, test their efficiencies and, and see what they do. So I would say that the discovery phase is still, you know, still relatively early, even though the TCJ is now, you know, coming to full fruition, but they haven't, for example, looked at in depth, um, multiple samples from the same individual. They haven't looked at that single cell level. They haven't looked at the di di dynamics of pre and post treatment um, and, and, and all of that. So, so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And, and we're still in the early phases, I would say, um, of, of really trying to understand the evolutionary properties of, of tumors. Yes? What about targeted sequencing? I mean, is that something that's productive? At this point, or yes. we still not know enough? No, I think, I think there are um, a subset of, uh, you know, very well characterized mutations um, that can indicate, uh, uh, potentially indicate a, uh, a therapy that could be administered. And, and that work is being done, and, and that's being done all over the place, and, as I said. 
uh, it's becoming routine. It's becoming, um, uh, you know, they're clinically certified tests that can be now administered to patients. And, um, and big centers like MD Anderson and, and the Mayo Clinic and, um, and, and, and the, um, the Dana-Farber in Boston and, and, and even in here, at, here at the OICR in Toronto um, and the OCI uh, have, have, have a clinical trial ongoing to do targeted sequencing. Um, and so, uh, so, and in our own center, uh, I would say between 15 and 20 percent of patients that we've looked at in this way, um, and these are patients basically on, the, these are called so-called last hope patients. They've failed all, all kinds of standard therapies, um, or they have primary tumors of unknown origin, um, and so the oncologist doesn't know what to do with them anyways. And so they've been enrolled in this, this project, and, and between 15 and 20 percent have yielded uh, a, a genetic abnormality that suggests a particular therapeutic intervention. And, and in, in those cases, there's been, um, you know, reduction in tumor size. And it's early days to know whether that improves quality of life and, 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 and how much that prolongs survival and, and all of that stuff. Um, but at least in the very early pilot projects, it's, it, all of the indications is highly favorable um, that more information is better.